like summer I feel like summer I feel like summer Good evening, everyone. Please take your seats. Thank you for coming. Before we begin, please note that audience appreciation is welcome through cheers, snaps, and applause. Please know any disruptions to the program will result in you being peacefully escorted out of the auditorium. Thank you, everyone, for understanding. Enjoy the evening. How can you stand for the national anthem of a nation that preaches and propagates freedom and justice for all that is so unjust to so many of the people living there? Why are we still fighting to be seen, to be heard, to be respected, to be free and equal? They inspire millions. Even where barriers seem insurmountable. As long as injustice and inequality persist in our world, none of us can truly rest. They speak truth to power, even when faced with great danger. They stand up for what they believe in. They push boundaries and give hope to the world. All of them act on their conscience. Despite the challenges, Despite the risks, 
they do what is right. They deserve our greatest honor. Amnesty International, Ambassador of Conscience. Everyone, please welcome actor and activist Sophia Bush. Good evening, and thank you all for coming. Welcome to the 2019 Amnesty International Ambassador of Conscience Award Ceremony. The Ambassador of Conscience Award is Amnesty International's highest honor celebrating people who've shown unique leadership and courage in standing up for human rights, people who have acted on their conscience and used their talents to inspire others. I'm incredibly honored to be here tonight with all of you. Amnesty's work has influenced my own career as an activist. I have learned so much from the people at Amnesty about how to press for real change their work around the world fighting oppressive laws, fighting human rights abuses, and making sure that all people have real equitable access to human rights is incredibly inspiring. And I'm thrilled to be here tonight, especially because we're focusing on environmental justice. As a kid who grew up in California, yeah, right? I was lucky enough to grow up in California playing in the woods and in the rivers and in the ocean. The environment was my first love and really the thing that spurred my activism. When Deepwater Horizon happened, I knew I had to do something. I'd been on TV for a couple of years and I figured what good is this platform if I'm not gonna use it to advocate for real change and for real environmental justice. And I learned so much from all of you in how to do that. So. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for helping me and so many people in this room find our voice and be real activists. It is my ultimate pleasure to introduce to the stage the Executive Director of Amnesty International USA, Margaret Huang. Come on up here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It's such an honor. Thank you a lot. Good evening. It's a thrill to be here with all of you this evening at this momentous event. We want to thank the George Washington University campus, students, and staff for their tremendous hospitality today and this evening. It's really lovely to be here. And a big thank you to some of the champions who have provided support to this event and to this evening, including Jamie Henn and Natalie Mabane of 350.org. And Valentina Stackle of Greenpeace, thank you. And a special thanks to the artists of the sanctuaries who created this incredibly beautiful banner here next to me. Give them a big round of applause. I also want to give a big shout out to a number of youth activist groups who've joined us here tonight. I hear we have Zero Hour in the house. We have the plaintiffs of our Children's Trust. The Earth Guardians are here. And Sunrise is in the house. Thank you all. We at Amnesty International like to say that our global movement of 8 million people around the world take injustice personally. And that's what we're using our global platform to lift up tonight, what we're recognizing in this room. While we're gathered here, my Amnesty friends and colleagues around the world are hosting this same event in over 25 countries in honor and recognition of the diversity and the global scale of the movement, the remarkable student climate strike movement. From the Faroe Islands to Peru, 
from Mexico to Nigeria, Japan, Malaysia, Slovenia, Portugal, Ireland, and many, many more, including in every state of Australia. Amnesty International is gathering around the world to pay tribute to the 2019 Ambassadors of Conscience. This year, Amnesty chose to lift up the work of these inspiring young activists who've worked so hard and tirelessly to raise the alarm on climate change. They have challenged leaders all over the world to listen, to shake off their apathy, and to act. Tonight, we honor and celebrate their spirit, their tenacity, and their resolve. We also need to recognize that many issues, like many issues we face today, climate change is complex and intersectional. While it affects all of us, it does not impact all of us equally. Often, indigenous people are at the front lines of defending the environment. We believe that true solidarity with indigenous communities is a human rights imperative. <laughs> Climate change exacerbates the difficulties that these communities already face. And those who fight back or who raise their voices in protest have faced threats to their own personal security. These human rights defenders are often targeted, whether in the Amazon, where indigenous communities are defending their land from unlawful seizure, violence, and government set fires, or in Mexico, where Julio Carrillo was murdered for resisting the logging and mining of his community's ancestral lands. Or here, in the United States, where native water defenders are facing repeated charges for protesting peacefully. Three years ago, we deployed delegations of Amnesty Human Rights Observers to Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota. We went to monitor the police response to protests of the indigenous communities fighting against the federal government's plan to allow an oil company to build a pipeline near their reservation. We also mobilized thousands of people to call local and state officials to demand that everyone's human rights be protected during and after the demonstrations. It is a personal honor to introduce someone who was there and our first youth leader to speak tonight. She was first involved in the movement to stop the Dakota Access Pipeline when she was just 13 years old. She's the youth leader of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe and an advocate for indigenous youth, indigenous rights, and for the protection of the land and the waters. Please join me in welcoming Tokata Iron Eyes. Hamidakiapi, Chantewa Stana Pechiusapi. Tokata we chase iron eyes and machiapi na malako chaje waniatiwi. Iwo sloha emataha na waziahaha elwati. Hello everyone, all my relatives, I welcome you with a warm heart and a good handshake. My name is Tokata we iron eyes. I am 16 years old now and I am from the Standing Rock Reservation. I currently live on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota and I am Hunkbapa and Oglala Lakota. Um, I'm so happy to be here with all of you today, and I am so honored to be speaking on this stage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think that one of the first things that always needs to be recognized when we're in spaces like this, beautiful spaces where we're all coming together to share our ideas and our dreams for solutions for a better world for the next seven generations, we have to be able to realize that these opportunities are scarce for a lot of people. We have to be able to realize and recognize the privilege, the privilege that we have to be a part of those solutions. Because it is the people and the communities who, who are the most affected by climate change and the climate crisis who are very rarely in these spaces with us. And it is my job and it is our job to, be to, to work together to make sure that those are the voices that are heard that the voices of the front lines, the voices who are being shot at, the voices who be are being silenced and killed, that those people are the ones who get to be here with us. For, for generations, for millennia, indigenous people have been oppressed. And so the fact that I get to stand here today is a step towards progress, but it doesn't need to stop here. I feel like I'm always looking for the next indigenous person in one of these spaces, looking for that companionship. It shouldn't have to be like that anymore because we are the curators of the spaces that we need. And if we know what we need, then why aren't we offering it to ourselves? <laughs> I think that as an indigenous person, I've seen the way that in this country, history has repeated itself. A lot of times we're talking about moving forward with a system that we know has not worked. The way in which our governments are trying to combat, and rarely they're trying to combat the climate crisis. We know that they are not curating solutions that are adequate for us because there is no solution without the protection of indigenous peoples, their culture and their community. Indigenous peoples are the caretakers for 80% of this world's biodiversity, 80%. And yet we are the least looked upon for leadership and for answers to the questions that we've been asking for generations. When we talk about solutions, we are talking about indigenous rights because there is already a blueprint for the work we're trying to do. And it has been here in this land and in these waters for millennia. It is not activism, it is a way of life. And if, if there is one thing that I can say to any of you in this room, if I can get to at least one of you, it's that you are never an outsider in these solutions. You are never an outsider in, in indigenous communities because you at all times are on indigenous land and you have a responsibility to protect it and watch over it because it is a part of you. It is a part of all of us. When we drink water, when we eat food, immediately we are a part of the earth around us. It is not a solution for the earth, it is a livelihood for us. It is our dreams, it is the dreams of our ancestors and the vision that we want to build for the future generations. That is what we're talking about when we're thinking about things as simple as what we put into our bodies. Things as simple as as f wanting clean water for your children. I am 16. I started speaking when I was nine years old. I am a child. I should not have to be on this stage. There should not be such a thing as a youth climate activist because it was not our responsibility. <laughs> At 16, at 16, I am worried. I am worried about what life is gonna look like if I wanna have kids. Why am I worrying about a daughter that doesn't exist yet? Why am I scared for my own clean water? We've seen what the fossil fuel industry has done to indigenous communities already, and we know that cl the climate crisis affects indigenous communities first. I'm scared and you should be scared because 
as an indigenous person, my problems, the things that I want for my children are the things that you want for your children and the things that you need for your future. I need you just as much as you need me. So thank you all for the work that you've done already. There's so much more that needs to be done. Please welcome the George Washington University's very own GW Vibes. Seem broken hearted. Ha, 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 ha. There's a drumming noise inside my head that starts when you're around. I swear that you could hear it, it makes such an almighty sound. There's a drumming noise inside my head that throws me to the ground. I swear that you could hear it, it makes such an almighty sound. Louder than sirens, louder than bells. Sweeter than heaven and hotter than hell. Louder than sirens, louder than bells. Sweeter than heaven and hotter than hell. Louder than sirens, louder than bells. Sweeter than heaven and hotter than hell. As I move my feet towards your body, I can hear this beat. It fills my head up and gets louder and louder. Sorry, I was just telling them how amazing they were and I missed my cue. Hi. <laughs> this next speaker is a member of the Amnesty International Youth Collective, where she engages young people in all aspects of the organization's work. She fights fearlessly for human rights, particularly at the intersection of indigenous people's rights, racial justice, and in bringing the climate crisis to the human rights movement. 
Please welcome Indira Walsh. Hello, everyone. It's so incredible to be in a room full of so many youth leaders. Um, yeah. I have been part of Amnesty International for four years, starting as a 14-year-old activist at South Brunswick High School. And as a young person, Amnesty showed me that human rights are universal and that every single person can do something to protect and defend human rights, no matter who or where you are. While organizing in my state, I've learned that all human rights issues are incredibly connected and that our environments and our climate drive social injustices. Amnesty activists are young people who show up and who do something. They don't just say something. In classrooms, in quads, and in communities across the country and around the world, Amnesty chapters challenge the status quo. We talk about important issues and we take action no matter how hard it might get. Today, we're facing what may well be the greatest human rights violation in the entire world history. Beyond the impacts of the national world, climate devastation is magnifying existing inequalities, and it's amplifying every human rights abuse in every corner. The failure of governments to act is going to ruin current and future generations. There are no human rights on a dead planet, and there are going to be no human rights for generations to come. And that's why we must act. Environmental justice is social justice. Yes. Yeah. And everyone on this earth has a right to a safe environment. Today, we're honoring youth leadership to stop the climate crisis. And we honor the bravery that is shown by young people every day to demand their right to their own futures. In a moment, you're going to meet a man who was expelled from school when he was 15 years old for leading a student protest. He recently described it as a devastating moment in his life and one that has redoubled his commitment to learning. As it happens, there is a lesson for everyone to learn from his story, because even though the immediate consequences were difficult, the decision that he made to walk away from school that day to challenge the injustice of the apartheid system in his home country of South Africa was not in vain because change did come. Despite having to flee the country and go into exile to complete his education, things worked out okay for him. I'm incredibly excited to introduce you all to Amnesty International Secretary General, Kumi Nadu. Thank you, Indira. Friends, colleagues, Ladies and gentlemen, my dear brothers and sisters, if I can start with the confession that the climate activists of today are a thousand times smarter than I was when I was 15 years old. <laughs> because when I was leading the march in the front and we were chanting, we want equality, by the time the slogan got to the back of the march, the younger kids were chanting, we want a color TV. <laughs> kids in white schools had color TVs, kids in black schools had no TVs. But my dear brothers and sisters, we are at a troubling moment in world history. We are in the middle of the biggest intergenerational human rights violation in history. Millions of people are suffering the catastrophic effects of multiple disasters, natural and man-made, which have been made worse by the realities of climate change. And sadly, if we do not get organized, things are going to get worse, from prolonged droughts and devastating storms to heat waves and wildfires, the warning signs are all around us. As the climate crisis deepens, that most basic condition for our existence and common life as humans, a livable planet, is more and more under threat. Ultimately, climate change constitutes a mass death penalty facing humanity. Human rights exist to help us live together in freedom, justice, and peace. But none of this is possible without a livable planet. The right to a livable planet is like Article Zero of human rights. The, the, science, 
The science is clear. We have less than 12 years to prevent irreversible and catastrophic changes to our planet, which will start to make human life more and more untenable. This is no less than a struggle for our very survival. The person that occupies a very powerful political office just around the corner, who is the only political leader in the world who denies the science of climate, needs to be remembered that nature does not negotiate. We cannot change the science. We can only change political will. And thankfully, changing political will is a renewable resource, if you know what I mean. And just to be clear, just to be clear, much as we always say, save the planet, we have to recognize that if we continue on the path that we are, we'll destroy our water resources, our soil, and not be able to produce food in a hotter and hotter climate. The end result is we will be gone. The planet actually will still be here. And actually, once we all become extinct, if that's the route we allow our politicians to take us, the forests will grow back, the oceans will replenish, and so on. So let's be very clear. The, Arctic, the struggle to avert catastrophic climate change is nothing more and nothing less than protecting our children and their children's futures, and we refuse to spare any energy to make sure that we achieve that. I could talk... I could talk about the dire warnings we hear from scientists describe the calamities that will be unleashed if we don't act now. But instead, I want to talk about hope because it's not too late yet. That hope and urgency has been embodied by one remarkable individual and millions of others who have joined her. Greta Thunberg and the Fridays for the Future School Climate Strike Movement have laid down the challenge to this world. In an apathetic world, in an apathetic world, drifting towards catastrophe, they have stood up as our collective conscience and said, enough is enough and no more. They have demanded that we stop turning a blind eye, stop making excuses, and start taking action. The Ambassador of Conscience Award is Amnesty International's highest honor, celebrating people who have shown unique leadership and courage in standing up for human rights. People who have acted on their conscience and used the talents to inspire others. In 2019, that description befits nobody more than Greta Thunberg and the Fridays for the Future School Climate Strike Movement. That is why, that is why we are delighted to honor them with the Ambassador of Conscience Award. Young people are often told that they are leaders of tomorrow. I am so glad that Tokata INI's Greta and the millions of activists of the Fridays for the Future activists ignored this message. If they wait until tomorrow, there will be no future for any of us. They have proved they have already leaders, and it's time for every single one of us to follow the lead. Let me conclude by saying that this, this award, very much strongly stated by Greta, is not about Greta herself. It's about the, every single person, every single young person who has taken part in every single protest that has happened to date. So all of the young people in this audience and who hear my voice, this is your award. Please. Please join me now in welcoming actor and producer Maggie Gyllenhaal and her daughter Romona. Thank you. Hello. I'm Ramona Sarsgaard. Thank you so much for letting me speak. I'm very nervous. 
This is very difficult for me. This is something that a 12-year-old isn't normally expected to do. But right now, children have been burdened with this problem, even children much younger than me. People who have been alive much longer than us have not taken necessary action and have left it to us. But I can never do enough to quench my fear of what would happen in the future if we didn't make a difference. A child should not have to have this responsibility. I sometimes feel like I am holding the weight of the world on my shoulders. Like my every move is threatening the lives of millions. Like if I didn't come and speak here tonight, everything would fall apart. Writing this speech was really hard as well. I felt really anxious because I felt like it was all up to me. But then I remember that I'm not the only one. That people like Greta Thunberg and organizations like Fridays for Future are out there. That there are people who care too. I remember when my dad first showed me a video of Greta Thunberg. It was last March. She was speaking at one of the climate talks. My dad told me that there was a global climate strike happening on the 15th. I felt like I couldn't just sit there, like I had to do something. I called all of my friends and showed them the video of her speaking. Together we organized a small strike at Brooklyn Borough Hall. I would never, know, I would never have known anything about this if I hadn't heard Greta Thunberg speak. She is my idol. She opened my mind. It would definitely be easier to pretend. To pretend that everything is fine. A kind of blind comfort would come from putting the, pushing the truth away. But to always hide your fears inside yourself would only make the reality and the fear bigger and more frightening. Nothing is going to change if you pretend it is not there. In order to truly make change, we cannot pretend that everything is fine. In reality, everyone is afraid of this climate crisis. It is only that some people are too afraid to address it. Too afraid to look inside themselves at the truth that they have been hiding for so long. In order to make change, we have to be brave enough to look to the truth that we are afraid of, bring it out into the open, and do something about it. Yeah. This climate emergency is no longer something in the future. This is happening now. We all need to join hands together and fight this crisis that is threatening all humanity because we are all humans and together we can stop this. Thank you so much. Ooh, um, <clears throat> I'm here because of my daughters. People always say that they would die for the people they love, their husbands, their wives, their children, and taking a bullet or throwing yourself in front of a train comes to mind. But it's easy to make a claim like that because it's rare, especially in 2019, that we're asked to throw ourselves in front of a train. It's a fantasy claim. But how often do we actually throw the people we love under the bus? How often do we sacrifice them to protect ourselves from things that seem terrifying in the world we live in or in our own minds? So, you know, I was hearing about the climate crisis. I believe in science. I believe in the terrible destruction of greed and unchecked capitalism. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I wasn't letting it in. It would hurt for a minute, it would terrify me for a second, and then I would push it away. And every time I did that, I was throwing my children under the bus instead of standing in front of the moving train. And then as my daughter, as my daughter Ramona grew up, it became impossible not to see that she's an activist. She can't push the uncomfortable thoughts out of her head. She can't stay asleep, numb, and mindless. And it was her pain and worry and the information she was finding and talking about and insisting that I think about with her that woke me up. And then one day her little sister asked me out of nowhere, as if she'd been quietly thinking about it for a long time, can you die from climate change? Of course it's the children who are leading this not just because it's their lives that will be the most affected and the lives of their children, but also because children don't have to deal in money yet. 
we do that for them. So the skewed, mind-numbing logic of greed that got us into this position hasn't really infiltrated them yet. And they can't understand why we aren't doing anything. They can't understand why we aren't doing anything. They can't understand because it doesn't make any sense. But I want to be honest, there are upsetting things about living with an activist who's not even 13. <laughs> she has a brilliant, vivid mind, but she is a child. When she goes into a store that still uses plastic bags or a cafe that gives out straws, she asks this girl here, <laughs> she asks the manager, uh, she asks for the manager and politely and gently suggests that they rethink their policy. Yeah, that's great, and that's brave, and that's more than I'm doing, or used to be doing, now I'm doing it too. Um, a nice uh, little sentence to have in your pocket is, make that your last straw. <laughs> anyway, but it also feels to me, and Ramona has confirmed this, when she does that, it's a little like that old feeling of step on a crack and you break your mother's back. As a child, that's literal. You remember, you know that feeling, even as a child, you knew it wasn't quite true, but you didn't step on the crack. And I think Ramona, and I wonder if any of the other children here who are activists, can relate to this idea of getting afraid in a childish, irrational way, that if she doesn't say something at every shop or stop every woman with her arms full of plastic bags coming out of the market or write and give a speech at an event like this tonight, despite being terrified, that she herself is responsible for the demise of the world. These are the thoughts of a child. But I also wonder if that's the mark of an activist. It's life or death, not just the movement in general, which this movement is, but each word and each detail, life or death. And I wonder if Greta Thunberg feels that way. I've watched her for about a year now, risking everything, standing in front of the train, taking insults hurled at her, managing adulation, and massive waves of energy coming at her. And I wonder if she felt right at home on that sailboat in a storm in the middle of the Atlantic, riding the waves. It's more than I ever imagined doing. It's the next generation, the next wave pushing us. And so knowing that I can't do what Greta Thunberg is able to do and what Ramona can do and what so many of you out there can do, I want to do what grown-ups are supposed to do for children. I want to offer support, some grown-up support. And it reminds me of a letter from Martha Graham, the brilliant modern dancer, to Agnes DeMille, her friend and student. It's a letter from one artist to another. But it occurred to me that it could totally be a letter from an activist to an activist, or from an artist to an activist, as the case may be. For many years, it hung on my acting teacher's wall, and I've come back to it for comfort, not sleepy, mindless comfort, but the kind of comfort you might offer a warrior. I'd like to read it to Ramona and Greta and to all the incredible student activists tonight, all the revolting children. <laughs> There is a vitality, a life force, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. If you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and be lost. The world will not have it. It's not your business to determine how good it is, nor how valuable it is, nor how it compares with other expressions. It is your business to keep it yours, clearly and directly, to keep the channel open. You do not have to believe in yourself or your work. You have to keep open and aware directly of the urges that motivate you. Keep the channel open. No artist or activist is pleased. There is no satisfaction whatever at any time there is only a queer, divine dissatisfaction 
a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and makes us more alive than the others. And now, here's a video. Please welcome Greta Thunberg. Much better. <laughs> um, just thank you, everyone who is here. I'm so honored to be in this room with so amazing people. And uh, give yourself an applause. <laughs> This award is for all those millions of people, young people around the world, who together make up the movement called Fridays for Future. All these fearless youth fighting for their future, a future they should be able to take for granted, but as, as it looks now, they cannot. With our business as usual, we are currently on track for a world that could displace billions of people from their homes, taking away even the most basic living conditions from countless of people, making areas of the world uninhabitable for humans for parts of the year. The fact that this will create huge conflicts and unspoken sufferings is far from a secret. And yet, the link between the climate and ecological emergency and mass migration, famine, violations of human rights and war is still not clear to many people. The changes and the politics required to take on this crisis simply doesn't exist today. 
That is why every single one of us must push from every possible angle to hold those responsible accountable and to make the people in power act and to take the measures required. We who together are the movement Fridays for Future, we are fighting for our lives. But not only that, we are also fighting for our future children and grandchildren, for future generations, for every single living being on earth whose biosphere we share, whose biosphere we are stealing, whose biosphere we are ruining. We are fighting for everyone, for you, for the people living in areas in the world that are already suffering the consequences from the first stages of the climate and ecological emergency. People who breathe toxic air, who drink contaminated water, who have to flee their homes because of climate and environmental related disasters. Indigenous communities whose lands and waters are being destroyed. People whose food and water supply is being threatened by environmental related catastrophes. Stronger and more frequent droughts, rainfalls, storms, or melting glaciers. Whole nations are now literally being left in ruins or disappearing underneath rising sea levels. People are dying and yet so many of us keep looking away. The world has never seen a threat to human rights of this scope. So said the UN rights chief, Michel Bachelet, during, recently during UN, UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, referring to the climate crisis. She said, the economies of all nations, the institutional, political, social and cultural fabric of every state and the rights of all your people and future generations will be impacted. This is exactly the clarity we need now from governments and the people in power. Right now, the world's emissions of greenhouse gases keep rising rapidly. The destruction of natural habitats are continuing at horrendous speed. Despite all the beautiful words and promises from our leaders, we are still moving in the wrong direction with unimaginable pace. It may seem impossible to pull the emergency brake, and yet that is what we have to do. But right now, I think there is an awakening going on. Even though it is slow, the pace is picking up and the debate is shifting. This is thanks to a lot of different reasons, but it is a lot because, because of countless of activists and especially young activists. Activism works. So what I'm telling you to do now is to act because no one is too small to make a difference. I'm urging all of you to take part in the global climate strikes on September 20th and 27th.
And just one last thing. See you on the streets. Okay. Um, please allow me to welcome the panelists. The first Fridays for Future activist launched her initial strike for climate here in Washington, D.C. at the United States Department of Energy last December. Please welcome Kaylin Benson. The next activist is a founder of the blog The Climate Reporter and is a DC strike organizer. Please welcome Jerome Foster II. Now we have a climate justice activist, journalist, and community organizer. She's been a leader in the Climate Strike social media campaign. Here is Iris Zahn. This next Fridays for Future striker has felt very connected to Greta. Like her, he has Asperger's. And he started striking at New York City Hall every Friday at just the age of nine. Please welcome Zane Cowie. The next activist is known as the first climate striker outside of Europe to join Greta. From Sudbury, Canada, at just 12 years old, please welcome Sophia Mather. And this last Fridays for Future striker is now a freshman student right here at GW University. Please welcome your own Khadija Kohar, Kokar. We don't have mics yet, so I'm gonna do this from here. Welcome to the stage, everyone. They're on our, the microphones are on the way out and we're gonna have a little panel, so enjoy. Thank you. You guys having a good night so far? Pretty incredible group. So, Greta, if you don't mind, I'm going to get started with you. You've just completed quite a monumentous journey traveling across the Atlantic with zero carbon emissions on your boat. And I followed the whole thing on Instagram, as I assume many people in the audience did. It was clearly an incredibly difficult accomplishment to organize, and I would imagine to physically complete. And I'm guessing that you had an awful lot of time to think on the journey. 
So I'm wondering what it taught you about the world that we live in and, and maybe what being on a boat for two weeks taught you about yourself. Um, it was an amazing time and um, it just, I think that was pretty good for me personally in that time because everything has just been so much and so many impressions, so much to, to process. So I don't, I don't really think I thought of anything new. All I did during that trip was to process everything that had already happened because it had already ha happened so incredibly fast and I, it's so hard to take in. So I got a chance to, to really take it in, but it's, it's still, I can't, still can't take it in, so, <laughs> but yeah. And I imagine that inability to sit still is true for so many of you. You have so much work to do and you're all such incredible committed activists. I'm curious for the panel, where each of you finds the inner strength to do the work you do in addition to the everyday pressures of being a kid. You have school, you have your social lives, you have, you have a lot on your plates and I'm wondering how you guys are managing it all. Well, for me, a lot of my innermost strength came, comes from all of you. All of you really inspire me so much, and you guys keep me going and to motivate me to not give up, because especially with like school and stuff, um, it's really hard to like keep at it and to tell you to, yourself to keep persisting, but you know that with this uh, climate crisis that you have to like keep up, and, you ha and that you know it's gonna, it's gonna be worth it. And also, I have to give a shout out to my parents who couldn't be here, but like they helped me with like everything, especially with school and activism and everything in life. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I have the privilege of having a very, very supportive family, which keeps me going and gets me out there. And where I draw the most hope from is from this community of activists. I have friends all over the world and sometimes you just have to sit down on a Zoom call and not talk about work. And it, talking with those people and making those friends and those connections, they drive you forward. They make you feel like you're not alone. They help you get farther in the world. Yeah, team, teamwork quite literally makes the dream work. So I wonder, and it's really two questions, and you guys can, can divvy them up if you like. I'm wondering what you would say a good day in the fight for climate justice looks like, and conversely, what does a bad day in the fight for climate justice look like? I think a good day would be when we see an emissions turn down on the graph, and I think that a good day is when we see so many young people across the nation, when we have a deep strike and we see the community of young people all around the world, that's when we have a good day on climate. And we see that like people aren't gonna continue to ignore millions of young people around the world standing up. And that world governments cannot just ignore us and be blind to the fact that we're destroying our future. And that's really what a good day is. And a bad day is when people continue to ignore us and can pe can people continue to say, even though that there's so many young people, we're just gonna continue to have business as usual and honestly there are many more bad days than good days because politicians aren't taking the necessary steps that they need to and that's really what we're still fighting for. Um, so for me I think that good days are what Jerome said and also on a smaller scale sometimes just getting out of a meeting and seeing that you've done progress Sometimes it's just like going to a strike and seeing how many passionate people there are who are fighting for the same thing as you are. And um, another, an example of a bad day is like going through Instagram and seeing everything that's wrong with the world. And like you get yourself stuck in like this momentum for a while where you're just like, everything sucks. And it seems like everything we're doing is hopeless at times. But then you have your good days and then you're back at it and you're like, you know what? What I'm doing means something, it's worth it. I'm fighting for a good cause and I just have to keep going. And as Callan said, the support system means a lot, so. I think a good day in the cl climate movement is probably when you're surrounded by people who treat the crisis like a crisis. Uh, like the May 3rd strike in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, there was so much youth from different schools um, joining together and it made me feel 
it just made me feel like I wasn't alone in the climate justice movement. Well, I have to thank you guys. As, as an adult who's always loved science, I'm very confounded that other adults are debating whether science is real. And I'm really grateful that all of you who are in school understand that in fact it is and we should take it seriously. I, I'm curious, when we think about that, do, do you guys think that ignorance or inaction is worse or is it really a combination of the two? I personally think that they stem from the same problem. They're kind of two of the same thing. Um, Ignorance leads to inaction, and action leads to ignorance. You, you can't separate the two of them. Um, well, I completely lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> I get very nervous when speaking in front of crowds. You're doing um, great. <laughs> um, okay. Well, does anyone else want to go? <laughs> well, I think that kind of what Callan is saying, I don't... I think that a lot of inaction comes from people not wanting to know and not wanting to take this crisis as what it is, a crisis. And I think that it scares people and, I mean, I'm terrified. I'm, I think we all are constantly terrified. But it is so much easier to pretend that this is not a real problem and to pretend that this is something that someone else can take care of and that one day someone is going to come and save the day rather than stepping in and being like, I am the person who is going to take action, and I am going to do this. So I think that, yeah, they're both mixed together, so. So what tangible change would you all say you'd like to see in the next 18 months when you talk about what gives you hope and, and the resilience that you find in a community of activists? What would you like to see us in this room help you push forward in the next year and a half? Just a casual, small question. <laughs> I would say, well, oh, okay. uh, I would say that for the next year and a half, we need to see, in America at least, um, we need to see people voting, and we need to see people after these strikes. Yeah. Yes. I think that when we talk about voting, we always take it back to personal, but we have to understand that we are all united in this country together and that we're all, patriotism doesn't just mean that you believe your country to a fault, but actually pick out the faults and say, hey, we need to change this. So, that, <laughs> and I think that like when we talk about voting, we have to be united in how we think about voting and think about how we need to be united as a generation. And that's really the work that Gerda has been doing with Fridays for Future is getting people to be aware of like, the fact that democratic systems, the change comes from the youth. Change comes from the people at the bottom, not from the top. And that people at the top can say, hey, we, we want, uh, we want like, justice and we want um, environmental justice. But the real change comes from the strikers every single Friday. The real change comes from the people that are lobbying in the Senate, like people that are there every single day building this movement up. And that's really what we're hoping, that we're demanding of for more leaders in the next year and a half, is that they actually take this crisis seriously and make real action, and that they know that this is real action that they need to take. And 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds aren't the people that can fathom the amount of change that needs to be making, but they have been in there for years. They have been in the system for years, and they understand the amount of ch the change that needs to be taken, and that they can't just ignore us anymore. And to add, oh, sorry. No, you want to go? <laughs> to add to that, I think that as a society, our first major step to combating this crisis is to stop burning fossil fuels. Um, <laughs> but personally, I think the most important thing we can do is to always think about it. I know for many of us, going around, it's always in the back of our heads, which means it affects every single little decision that we make. And I can't say for like, what's the best decision you can make or what's the best decision you can make. That's what, something that you have to decide. But thinking about it means that you're at least taking it into account when you're making whatever decision it is, whether it's a small one or a really big one. I 
I wanted to just touch up on something that Jerome briefly mentioned, but he talked about youth power and like there are a lot of youth in this audience and I think that it's important to realize that all nonviolent movements start with the youth. So if you don't think you have like the power in this movement, you're wrong because I mean every single nonviolent movement started with us. And so it's important that we build that momentum and it's important that adults support us and they it causes a snowball effect and that's how change is made. So I think that all of us in that extent have that responsibility. Could I add one more thing? Is that building off of what you're saying is that young people have so much power and that everything started with us is that we need people, we need a support system to be able to educate like young people and that only comes from other young people and that's really the work that we're going to do after the strikes on September 20th and after the strikes on, on throughout the rest of the year and mobilizing young people and like the work that one million of us is going to be doing over the next year is mobilizing young people and learning them, how, teaching them how to vote and teaching them the importance of their vote and the impact of their voice and that's really what we're going to be doing at one million of us at Fridays for Future and March for Our Lives and all these other youth movements that have been leading young people across the nation and across the world. Incredible. And don't forget, it doesn't stop at September 20th. Then we have September 27th, and we are going to continue striking every single Friday until we see action. And action and change require consistency. This is a long game. And I have to say to you guys, as a person who works with the voting rights organization, one of the things I've seen that has been the most impactful among adults who, to your point, might be a little jaded, who might not think they can change the system, is when their kids do the kind of research you guys are doing and sit their parents down and say, this is why I need you to vote this way for me. That changes the minds of adults. So your activism matters. You pushing the grown-ups in your lives to vote in the right way matters. And you guys are incredible examples of just how powerful the youth voice can be. I am curious, one last question, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting the signal, I want to keep you up here all night. But I'm wondering, what message do you have for adults who might be here, or adults who might be following along at home, who want to support you all and don't necessarily know where to start? Well, um, it depends on a lot of conditions because like everybody's different and stuff. But like I think that for everyone, uh, for all adults, they really need to I guess understand like how the mo what, what's happening in the youth movement so they can better understand like where they can fit in, and um, so that they can learn about um, how or different organizations work like Fridays for Future and how they can like strike with us on like September 20th and like going on and. Um, especially voting, just like uh, Jerome talked a lot about and everyone else talked a lot about. So those are important ways that adults can support us. And so um, just being there for your children because that's your responsibility. So, yeah. yeah. I like it. I think adults need to educate themselves about the climate crisis. And the, I personally... <laughs> I personally think that adults should come to our strikes on September 20th and September 27th and come out and support the Fridays for Future movement. Okay, just one, one last question. I got, I got one more. I do want to know, because it is a crisis. The circumstances are dire and it requires action and vigilance, but I'm curious for each of you what gives you hope right now. Again, I have to say it's this incredible community of organizers around the world. I, I could never do this if it weren't for the fact that I have such amazing friends who I know are out there. And you know I've never met them before. I've only been on Zoom calls with them, but I love them nonetheless. <laughs> and they give me hope. They give me the energy to keep going forward. Just like what Callan said, a good support system is what's the most powerful in this situation. The fact that there are so many youth who are striking, it's so powerful. It's so inspiring to see the work that we are putting in have an effect and have a snowball effect across the world. So that is definitely one of the most hopeful parts and seeing your work pay off.
It really gives me hope just being here right now and seeing each and every one of you just here. You took your time off to be here to, to support youth and everyone is here and I just want everyone to give themselves a round of applause. Well said. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming, traveling from all the places that you did and for your work. You guys are astonishing. Surely we can put our hands together one more time for this amazing, amazing young people. No, no, no. I can just sit. Wait, wait. Thank you. If I can ask our wonderful leaders to just sit for a minute because I want to say a few things to you. Uh, when I look at the school climate strike movement and its amazing young leaders, I have to confess not only me, but Bill McKibben and a few others feel a little bit old. Uh, for me, in just over 10 years, I'll be considered like retirement age. But there is one thing I especially want to do when I turn 65 years old. Greta, I'm sure you and all the leaders here are going to be in very high demand by then. But I want to invite you all to my 65th birthday party. Uh, and I'd like to invite all the people in this room as well. It'll be a special moment of celebration, not because of my birthday, not for an award, but for something much more important. I want us to come together to celebrate one of the most important achievements the world has ever seen. We will celebrate that we, all of us here, all our friends from the Fridays for the Future movement, Amnesty International, 350.org, Greenpeace, the trade union movement, and many, many others, will come together, work hard, stay focused and undeterred, and we will celebrate that we did what it took to protect our world. We will, we will look back on how we ultimately overcame our leaders' suicidal obsession with fossil fuels and how we managed to arrest the rise in global temperatures and allowed the earth to start recovering. We will celebrate how we managed to bring carbon emissions right down how we kept ice where it belongs, how we kept the sea level safe and protected old countries going underwater. We will celebrate how amazing environmental and climbing, climate activists around the world persevered in the face of threats and showed us what it takes to live peacefully with the world around us. That's what I want to do, and what a party it will be. We will get to celebrate with the people of Tuvalu, and all the Pacific Island states and all the small island states who still will say we have a country that we can live on. We'll celebrate with the people of Pakistan, Asia, Africa, Latin America who can still say we still have clean water to drink. We will celebrate with communities in Africa who were able to stay together because climate-intensified desertification and climate-intensified drought, which is killing our people already, had been reversed. We will celebrate with the families of, in the United States whose communities survived because the wildfires stopped growing. We'll celebrate with the parents of children in China whose asthma became manageable when the pollution started dropping. And we'll celebrate with farmers in every continent around the world who could still be able to plant crops and feed us. You know what? In a world so bitterly fragmented, there should be one thing that brings us all together. That is the shared plight of all of us humans in facing the climate crisis. 
Imagine you were to look at the earth from afar and think of us as puny, tiny humans fighting over whether it's worth saving our common home, our only home. Imagine the insanity of that. Because make no mistake, unless we act urgently, climate change will arm all of us. Greta, you and the Fridays for the Future movement have catalyzed and held, or held up a mirror to our species. All of us need to rise up and take action. And, an, and I hope every one of us will join hands with the Fridays for the Future movement, starting with a global strike on the 20th and the 27th of September. Let's make this the biggest climate protest ever in the history of humanity. Let's, so, so I want to conclude by saying two things. Both of them are naughty. So the first thing I want to say is, if I was a dictator, and if I could make a decree on the Fridays for the Future Movement, this is what it will be. I would say to you, don't let Donald Trump and the Bolsonaros of the world take away your childhood. Don't let... And as you prosecute this movement, as wonderfully as you've did, and as many of you have said in your comments, do it with love, do it with compassion, do it with integrity, and most of all, my decree would say, have fun in the process. The second thing I want to say is that to all those of you in this audience who work in communications capacities, whether for a government, business, or NGO, you can learn a lot from this young people's movement in terms of how they communicate. They have a better sense of being able to take the BS and make it more accessible to much larger numbers of the people. I had a small experience watching, marching in London as we were passing Downing Street, you know, where the cabinet meets, two 12-year-olds picked up a sign saying, you can get better cabinets at Ikea. <laughs> right? uh, and uh, two 14-year-olds picked up a sign saying, keep Earth clean, it's not Uranus. <laughs> Don't try that in Germany, I tried it once, it didn't work. <laughs> so, as we say thank you, to these amazing young people, let me just say one thing in conclusion. And I add a bit of a caucus with Bill McKibben from 350 while you were talking. To all of us who are adults here, if our children are saying that the climate crisis is so serious that every Friday they will continue to make the voices heard one day a week, so our politicians don't forget the need to act. Why should we, as parents, not set up a hashtag that says Saturdays for our children's future and ensure that moving forward, every Saturday, parents are urged to come out to put pressure on their banks to stop lending to fossil fuels, to start doing community actions in our community to educate people, because it's high time we as adults did half as much as what our children are doing because that is our responsibility. So, so as we talk about the agenda moving forward, there are lots of things that are planned. Many of us are going to New York to take our message to leaders who all seem to have the same medical condition, which is they all seem to have problem hearing. So we have to keep the voice loud and so on. But as we go there, Bill McKibben and I have just had a little chat. We will take a message to the Human Rights and Climate Summit where we're trying to get the human rights organizations more actively involved to make a call that we start making Saturdays a day where parents come out and compliment the heroism, the courage, and the tenacity of our young people. Thank you very, very much for your inspiration, for your guidance, and for your support. Well, yes, well.
well deserved. All right, guys, I know where I'm going to see you all on Friday and Saturday, right? Please welcome to the stage the Musicianship Washington Youth Choir. Turns out they need some equipment, so I'm just going to come hang with you guys. <laughs> okay, we have a plan for the 20th, yes? We have a plan for the 27th, yes? I would love to hear from the parents in the room if you're on board with this Saturday activism hashtag plan, yes? Good. I promise I won't sing to you guys. It's really not my spiritual gift.